In this very first video of the calculus theory production list, we're going to be working with limits. Before learning what a limit is, I want to see a few examples. Let's say we have the function f of x equal to x times the sine of 1 over x. We know, because we have 1 over x here, that the domain of f will be the set of the real numbers except the zero. We also know that the sine of something, let's call it theta, is always between minus 1 and 1, so the absolute value of the sine of theta is smaller to 1. And this is valid for all theta in the real numbers. So then we know the absolute value of f of x is the absolute value of x times the sine of 1 over x. Now, using that the absolute value of the product is the product of the absolute values, we have that this is absolute value of x times the absolute value of the sine of 1 over x. But then 1 over x is just another real number, and so the sine, the absolute value of the sine of 1 over x is smaller to 1. So then this is smaller to the absolute value of x. What this is telling us is that our function is between minus the absolute value of x and the absolute value of x. And so, let's say I want my function to be smaller to a number, for example, 1 over 20. Then all we have to do is take x to be smaller to 1 over 20. And so what this is telling us is that the plot of our function looks something like this. We can draw the axis. Now the function absolute value of x looks something like this. And minus absolute value of x, something like this. So we know these are minus absolute value and the absolute value. We know that f will be between these two plots. And in the zero, it's not well defined. So this is just a sketch of what f looks like. But if we think about it, it's not defined in zero, but our plot is always getting closer and closer to zero because it's always bounded by these two functions that in zero are both zero. So we can think as there is a value for f near zero, and that is what it's going to be called a limit. In this case, it would be the limit when x tends to zero for f of x. And in this case, the functions are always getting smaller and smaller, closer to zero. So in this case, this limit would have a value of zero. And the same happens when we take, for example, f of x equal to x squared times the sine of 1 over x. Now as the sine of theta is smaller than or equal to 1, then this time our function will be bounded by minus the absolute value of x squared and the absolute value of x squared. So when we try and plot this other function, We know how to plot x squared. It's something like this. And minus x squared is something like this. This is all a sketch, so it's just an approximate drawing. And now f of x has to be between these two plots. So it'll look something like this. And it actually tends more to zero than the previous one. That is because x squared is closer to zero than the absolute value of x. So again, here we have another example where the limit when x tends to zero of f of x is equal to zero. And this limit exists even if f of zero is not defined. 
Once we have all this, we are now able to see the definition of a limit. So, as we said before, what's important about this definition is that we don't care about the value of f in x0, but we do care about the values of f near x0. The definition says that we say that f has a limit l if for every epsilon greater to 0 there exists a delta greater to 0, this delta will be depending on epsilon, such that the absolute value of the difference between our function and the limit is smaller to epsilon for every x different to x0, such that the difference between x and x0 is smaller to delta. So to understand this definition, we first look at this delta greater to zero. What delta will be measuring is how near x is of x zero. So we say that if x minus x zero is smaller to, uh, to delta, then x is near x zero. And this x different to x zero is because Again, we don't care about the values of f in x0. In these previous examples, we had that the limit of f when x tends to 0 existed, but f was not defined in x0, so we, we can't actually maybe evaluate f in x0, but we can calculate the limit. And now the value of epsilon, what epsilon does is check how close our function is to the limit. So if f of x minus l is smaller to epsilon, then f is near l. Now a bit on the notation we're going to be using. We can say that the limit when x tends to x0 of f of x is l. And we'll also say f of x tends to l when x tends to x0. We're going to be using both these notations and these are also the ones most books are using. Let's try and see what this means graphically. We have the axis, we have here our limit l, and let's say that our function does something like this, where this point is going to be x0. So we're given an epsilon and we're gonna look at l plus epsilon and l minus epsilon. And for this epsilon we need to find a delta such that when we look at the values between x0 minus delta and x0 plus delta, the values of the function f are between L minus epsilon and L plus epsilon. So then if we're given another epsilon, we have L plus let's say epsilon 1 and L minus epsilon 1, we need to be able to find another delta such that when we look at the values between x0 minus delta 1 and x0 plus delta 1, then now the values of our function are between L plus epsilon 1 and L minus epsilon 1. If we can do this for every epsilon that's greater to 0, then we say that the limit when x tends to x0 of f of x is L. Let's view this in a few examples. We first have to prove that the limit when x tends to 3 of 2x plus 1 is equal to 7. In our case, 3 would be the x0, 2x plus 1 would be f of x, and 7 would be our limit l. So let's start first by writing what f of x minus l is f of x is 2x plus 1 and l is 7. 
So this is the absolute value of 2x minus 6. Taking common factor 2, we have 2 times x minus 3. And now again, the absolute value of the product is the product of the absolute values, and the absolute value of 2 is just 2. So we have 2 times the absolute value of x minus 3. And as always, as we've seen in the calculus 1 reproduction list, when we were working with sequences, we always start with let epsilon be greater to 0. So what we want is f of x minus l to be smaller to epsilon. f of x minus l is 2 times the absolute value of x minus 3. We want this smaller to epsilon. So x minus 3 is smaller to epsilon over 2. Now this was all just an observation. But once we go to something like this, once we have x minus x0 smaller to something that does not depend on x, something that depends only on epsilon, then we can start with the proof. The proof will be let epsilon be greater to 0 and take delta that depends on epsilon be equal to epsilon over 2 in this case, this number would be the one here. So, using now the definition of a limit, if x minus x0, which is 3, is smaller to delta, which is equal to epsilon over 2, then multiplying by 2, we have 2 times x minus 3 smaller to epsilon. And this is the absolute value of 2x minus 6 smaller to epsilon, which can be written as 2x plus 1 minus 7. And this is smaller to epsilon. But again, this is just rf minus the limit. So then this is proving that the limit when x tends to 3 of 2x plus 1 is 7, which is what we were trying to prove. Let's continue with another example. We want to prove that the limit when x tends to 2 of x squared is equal to 4. In this case, 2 would be our x0, x squared would be our f of x, and 4 will be our limit l. And as before, we're going to start with f of x minus l. This is x squared minus 4, which can be written as x minus 2 times x plus 2. Again, using the properties of the absolute value, this is the absolute value of x minus 2 times the absolute value of x plus 2. And we want this to be smaller to epsilon. Now, something that would be wrong and that is very common is first we see that here we have x minus x0 and so it would be wrong for us and that's why I'm doing it in red to say x minus 2 would be smaller to epsilon divided by x plus 2. So just take delta equal to this and we have finished pretty much with the proof. But this is wrong because delta must not depend on x. It can only depend on epsilon. So this would be wrong. And what we're gonna do to solve this problem is try and bound these two factors. So let's say we have delta prime equal to 1. And we say that x minus 2 is smaller to this delta prime, which is 1. What we're saying here is that minus 1 is smaller to x minus 2, smaller to 1. And now adding 4 to make this x minus 2 and x plus 2, we have minus 1 plus 4 is 3, smaller to x plus 2, 
smaller to 1 plus 4 is 5. So if x minus 2 is smaller to 1, then x plus 2 in absolute value is smaller to 5. So again, the absolute value of f of x minus l is equal to x minus 2 times x plus 2. And we said that x plus 2 was smaller to 5, so this can be smaller to x minus 2 times 5. This is 5 times x minus 2, and we want this to be smaller to epsilon. So then, what will happen is that x minus 2 is smaller to epsilon over 5. And again, another mistake would be saying, just take delta equal to this. This is again wrong, because we said that x plus 2 was smaller to 5, if x minus 2 was smaller to 1. So this step here is valid only if x minus 2 is smaller to 1. And we have to take that into consideration when taking a delta. So what we're gonna do is just take delta to be the minimum between 1 and epsilon over 5. This way we have two things. We have that delta is smaller than or equal to 1, and that delta is smaller than or equal to epsilon over 5, because it's going to be the smallest of these two. So then, if x minus 2 is smaller to delta, here we are starting the proof. We have an epsilon greater to 0, and we take delta to be this minimum value. Now we say if this x minus x0 is smaller to delta, let's see what happens with f of x minus l. The absolute value of f of x minus l is x minus 2 times x plus 2. And this is because delta is smaller than or equal to 1, we have that x plus 2 is smaller to 5. So we compound this with x minus 2 times 5. But then again, because now we also have that our delta is smaller than or equal to epsilon over 5, and we have x minus 2 smaller to delta, then x minus 2 can be bounded with epsilon over 5 times 5 which is epsilon. So we have that our function minus the limit is smaller to epsilon, which is exactly what we needed to prove in order to say that the limit when x tends to 2 of x squared is equal to 4.